turn once again to Matthew, Gospel, chapter 5. We're going to conclude, Lord willing, the end of the first chapter of Matthew as we conclude really Jesus' teachings and extrapolations on the law and its application to Christian's life. What becomes evident as you walk through this passage, but it's true even in our daily lives on a whole host of matters, the places you go or the where you spend your time or the persons you spend your time with, they influence you. Those you spend time with and the places even you spend time in, they change you. Sometimes this will be rather obvious. We'll see it in the coming months, I'm sure. It'll be plain for all to see that someone has returned from some sunny, warm vacation as they look all sun-kissed and tan or burnt and red. We will have wished we were with them. Or you'll see it in inspiring young athletes who try and replicate the moves and even the looks of the professionals. I don't know how many times in youth basketball games I saw kids chomping on their mouthpieces just like Steph Curry does over and over again. It's true of aspiring preachers. Those that they listen to, they end up sounding like, in, in, emulating their very gestures, their cadence, their expressions, their tone. Or you can even see it with spouses. As they seem to age together, they become almost one person. And of course they are in the sense of marriage. But as they age together, in an eerie way, they become more and more looking alike even. Have you seen this? Maybe look in the mirror one day. They start dressing alike. They start moving alike. They start aging alike. They talk alike. Certainly they think alike. Those you spend time with, they influence you. They change you. They, as it were, they get inside of you. And, and so then they form you into their image. So then the question for us is, whose image have you been patterning yourself after? Who have you been spending time with? Who has got into you in that sense, into your soul, into your mind, and is changing you and conforming you into their image? At his funeral, this word was said about the great pastor Richard Sibbs. Heaven was in him before he was in heaven. Heaven so captured Pastor Sibbs that he just exuded heaven. God just came out of him because he was so intimately connected with God. And this is the work that our Father in heaven is still doing even now as heaven breaks into our hearts and changes us and transforms us. To summarize the rest of Matthew 5, I would do it this way. Heaven breaks in and changes Christ's people to be like their, and this is the key word in this text, their heavenly Father. Their heavenly Father. Heaven breaks in and transforms the people of the earth, namely the people of the kingdom of heaven. So then the question to us must be this morning, can others see heaven in you? Can others see the transforming work of heaven in your heart? Because God has come to dwell there. And we'll see it in four ways that we become like our Father as He changes us from the inside out. Because we'll see that heaven raises first our commitment to marriage, verses 31 and 32. Second, heaven raises our estimation of our word, our own word. Third, heaven raises our willingness to be wrong. And heaven raises our love to heaven's height. In short, heaven makes you radically different than you were before. It makes you radically different than all the other people of the earth because you are kingdom people of heaven. Because heaven comes to live in you. Let's see that play out with first. Heaven raises our commitment to marriage. These past weeks, we studied Jesus' words when he says, I came not to abolish, but to fulfill the law, to fulfill the law and the prophets. And we've noted that this means two things, at least. One, he comes to fulfill the law for us, on our behalf. He's the, the sacrifice, the, the ultimate Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world that all of the sacrifices before in the law had pointed to. His perfect life earned for us on our behalf God's love and favor. This is the way he's fulfilled the law. But secondly, he fulfills God's law not only for us, but in us. Just as the prophets had given from long ago, we looked at these last time, God had promised to cause a new birth in his people. 
to change their hearts, to cause them to be born again. Or the prophet Ezekiel put it this way, that he would put his spirit right inside of his people. And to do what? You remember? Cause them to walk in my commandments and my statutes. He fulfills the law on our behalf, but he also fulfills the law in us. He causes us and conforms us to the will and law of God. In other words, heaven breaks into our hardened, rebellious hearts and transforms them, transforms us, but from the inside out. And to illustrate this change we considered last time, Jesus explains what this looks like when heaven breaks in and changes you. Namely, when he deals with the law and explaining the law, namely about murdering, it was never merely about not killing people. It's about anger. It's about the root heart issue that would lead someone to kill. Or if we look at the next paragraph, verses 27 to 30, the law was never merely about not committing adultery, but it was about changing that adulterous lustful heart, you see. But that's not all. Christ provides four more examples here about how heaven breaks in and changes it. And what becomes evident is he keeps making this contrast, their basic understanding of what the law and how the teachers taught it, and then he says, but I say to you, and when he draws that every time, God's not so concerned with the letter of the law, especially if it's devoid of a changed heart. He gets every time at the heart of the matter, what was the intent? Because that's what God is after. He's after the heart. And this applies to God's law, even about divorce, that was given there in the Old Testament. Let's read it there, as quoted here, Matthew 5, verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. In fact, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament law on divorce as given in Deuteronomy 24. Only behind this understand for the Jewish leaders and teachers, there stood this raging debate about what justified a lawful divorce. The laws originally stated in Deuteronomy, frankly, was rather vague. And that's what led to these battling various interpretations of the different camps in Judaism. One camp among the Jews contended that there must have been some sort of sexual sin one way or another to justify a divorce, while another camp took a rather other extreme view, and basically for any reason, if the husband was dissatisfied, he could put out his wife and separate from her, even as the Jewish leaders would talk about, even if he burned dinner, <coughs> he could put her out. Well, Jesus cuts through that whole debate by bypassing all of the technicalities and talking about what justifies a lawful divorce. And he gets right after God's heart and God's intent for marriage. Look at verse 32. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now we have two statements here. And then there's one qualification clause built in. But to hear the force, the weight, if we don't already, of what Jesus is saying here, let's hear these two statements without the exception, without the clause. Because you'll feel then what Jesus is contending for here with marriage. So the first statement would be then simply, everyone who divorces his wife makes her commit adultery. Wow. That seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? Or rather strange, even. I mean, as you look carefully there, the husband here, he's the one who enacts the divorce, and yet it's the wife that's then, he says, is forced into a, an adulterous relationship. How does that work? Well, there's this, con, uh, this common assumption in this ancient society and how it worked. If a woman was to be separated from her husband and her really only provider, she would befall poverty and destitution unless she did what, of course? Got married. She would be forced to join herself to another man, but apparently so in only an illegitimate way. Because he says here she would be committing adultery. Well, how does that work? How could that be? But only that according to Jesus, seemingly, that first marriage was never properly dissolved. That's why she was being adulterous. And notice she doesn't commit general sexual immorality, but the specific sin of adultery, which that's, that requires logically that she would have to still be married 
that is, in that first sense or time. Which that too explains the rationale behind Jesus' second statement, again there to verse 32. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So imagine the scenario, a man who has never been married, let's say he's always been single and celibate, but then if he marries, it's apparently a divorced woman, he commits adultery? And why would that be? Well, the logic is the same from before. Namely, her first marriage, because she was previously married and now divorced, was never properly dissolved, apparently, in Jesus' sight anyways. What has Jesus done here? He's highlighted the true oneness that's created by the marital union. Marriages are not something that really should ever be divorced, Jesus is saying. Now, this topic of divorce, it resurfaces later in Matthew's Gospel. As the Pharisees themselves, they try and pull Jesus into this debate about what's the acceptable reasons for divorce. And they pose this question to him. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause, like, say, burning dinner? And note Jesus' reply. Because he goes right back to the law. He goes right to back when marriage was created in Genesis. He says this. Hear Jesus' answer. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Basically saying you don't divorce because God has joined this together. Don't let any man put that together or pull that apart. Rip it asunder. But then the Pharisees immediately object. Yeah, but what about Moses? What about Deuteronomy chapter 24? There has to be room for divorce, at least sometimes. And again, Jesus retorts, and he goes back to the beginning. He goes back to God's design, God's intent for when he created marriage. Matthew 19, verse 8. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Divorce was only a concession, Jesus notes, because of our hardness of heart. Even as the law set forth, which Genesis is part of the law, that was not God's good plan from the very beginning. When God created marriage, He never, in that sense, intended for marriages to be violated by adultery or to be annulled ever. Now, with that said, though, things are not as they were when God first created them. Sin has entered in. And sin attacks, undermines, and subverts all the very good things of God that God has made, and that certainly includes marriage. And so in here, here it is in Matthew 19, or back to our text in Matthew 5, Jesus does provide at least one justification, one reason for a permissible divorce. And what was it there in Matthew 5? But sexual immorality. Now what's interesting is that Jesus uses such a broad term here for sexual sin. That is, he's been talking all about adultery, which is a more narrow form of that. And he's been using that word throughout this text. But instead he goes back to a more broad term and he says sexual immorality. Pornea in the Greek language that it was written. And that it certainly includes adultery, but it encapsulates far more. It encapsulates all kinds of sexual immorality and perversion that might fall short of quote unquote adultery. That is, evidently, divorce is not something Jesus takes lightly, but neither does he see sexual immorality, pornea, as a minor thing either. And why not? Because that kind of immorality, it undermines the intimacy, the trust, the privacy, and companionship of that marital union. And when that's been broken, when that kind of trust has been dashed to pieces, it can be most difficult to reestablish it, and perhaps at times impossible. On this earth, anyway. 
And so that's the thing. Even as he gives the concession, Jesus is not, he does not command divorce if there's been sexual morality. And given how Jesus looks at divorce here, we should seek to restore every marriage even as they walk through infidelity of whatever kind or another. And praise God, there are examples in our own congregation, in our midst, where grace, forgiveness, and repentance have overcome such failings. Those marriages are among you and they remain. And frankly, a marriage that could overcome such a betrayal like that is one that examples God's own love for His wayward people in the Gospel, isn't it? Like Hosea's Gomer. We've sought and we've loved others more than Christ, and yet He still sought us in our infidelity. He bought us with His life. He wooed us back. Our adulterous and idolatrous hearts were not worthy of His love, and yet He loves the unlovely. Nevertheless, this deep cut of faithlessness might never properly heal on this earth. And with that, divorce over sexual immorality is permissible. It's not mandatory or demanded, but it's allowed. Now to draw this out from the rest of Scripture a little bit more, in the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 provide one more justifiable reason for separation, namely abuse or abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. But save those two cases, abandonment or sexual morality, a husband and wife should never divorce. Irreconcilable differences don't cut it. God doesn't permit divorce over that. Or that you just don't feel in love anymore. God put together, you together for life. That's marriage. And that's how Christ is committed to us, His bride, you see. The church, through all her failings, her agings, her wrinkles, her missteps, He loves us still. That is what your marriage was intended. It was designed to demonstrate and put on display. This is what God's intended with marriage all along. And Christ seeks to establish that and galvanize that in the hearts of His people. But before we move on, we've got to deal with two remaining questions. And we'll talk more about this, Lord willing, if we come to it in Matthew 19. And, you know, probably a couple years or something like that. <laughs> so let me at least address these questions briefly. What if I'm divorced appropriately, that is on biblical grounds, abandonment or infidelity for my spouse? Does God permit me to be remarried? If I'm divorced appropriately, according to God's word, can I be remarried? Yes, it does. That, that's the implication even of this exception clause. He immediately uses the exception, that is, except for the grounds of sexual morality. He uses that right in the context of not being remarried. Jesus does here. If you have grounds for divorce, you can be remarried and do so without committing adultery. Namely, because your first marriage was justifiably terminated. It really ended. Okay, But that leads to a next and obvious question. What if my divorce was not on biblical grounds and I already got remarried? What am I to do now? Well, let's say it just from the beginning. You shouldn't have been remarried then. Okay. That's a sin. And you need to repent from that. And that means repenting before God and repenting to others. With that said, though, though repentance will mean acknowledging your sin and even whatever other wrongs you have done, Repentance should not mean getting divorced yet even again, to be clear. Don't make another wrong. But rest in Christ's mercy. Go back to the gospel. Thank Him for this. Maybe in your ignorance even. And live in such a way with your current spouse that you put on display Christ's unwavering love for His quite imperfect bride. That's where we stand with this. Heaven raises our estimation and commitment to marriage. It also raises our estimation of our own word. Let's see that in verses 33 to 37. Jesus breaks into our hearts and He raises our fidelity. As the heavens established in us, we become more trustworthy like our Father. And this new trustworthiness is seen in our speech and our words. They become plain and true. And Jesus, to draw this out, goes right after oaths and promises. 
Let's look now, Matthew 5, verse 33. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Again, he begins with the Old Testament. He goes to law and oaths or solemn promises. And in effect, is quoting Numbers chapter 30 and Deuteronomy 23. They both illustrate those passages, Numbers 30 and Deuteronomy 23. Those illustrate that just the summary on oath giving in the Old Testament law. For example, listen to Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. And against the backdrop here, similar to the debates on divorce, the Jewish leaders and rabbis of the time, they had fabricated a whole hierarchy for oath-taking and making promises. Namely, that you could swear by heaven or earth or by your own head. And that would be, you understand, less significant than if you swore by God directly. They had a whole elaborate system for grading how serious an oath might be based on the object you swore by. But instead, you understand, instead of encouraging truth-telling and integrity, can you imagine what this does? To have at your disposal a whole series of objects to grade and rate how forthright you are trying to be. What would that lead to? It leads to clever and seemingly pious ways to lie and deceive, is what it leads to. And to that, here's what King Jesus says, verse 34. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Well, that's simple. Don't take oaths whatsoever. Don't swear, period. And then Jesus targets a series of these lesser things that you might swear by to, you know, create some room or cover for your half-truths, your lies. You know, because I didn't swear by God. I wasn't taking that seriously. As if to say, ah, but I was crossing my fingers. It doesn't really count. But here's what Jesus says. Verse 34. Do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the supposed, or excuse me, it's the city of the great king. And notice how each lesser thing that you might swear by, really in the end, it does have some connection back to God. Whether it's heaven, that's actually God's throne. Or whether it's earth, it's actually God's footstool. Or even, you can't swear by Jerusalem, because that's the city of the great divine king. God is in everything, and your word is right before him. Whatever you would swear by. Whatever you would swear or promise by, instead of doing it by God, either way, you're really bound to your word and your promise because God is involved. Well, what if I swear by my own head? Here's Jesus' response to that, verse 36. Do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. In other words, you have no control over your head, your life in that way as so many hair salons can testify. You can't just, of your own sheer will, change your hair color or bring it back. It has to be dyed, blue. It's like a kid that makes the promise, I cross my heart, I hope to die. No, you don't. And you don't have any control over your life like that anyway. You don't number your days, God does. And so instead of messing with oaths and figuring out, well, what's the right object to swear by, King Jesus just gets at the heart of the law and he, he says, this is what it looked like when God invades the heart, verse 37. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Or more literally, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Instead of taking oaths, crossing your heart and solemnly swearing, just say yes or no and mean what you say. When heaven breaks into your heart, your response and your word should be so reliable that people can just take what you say at face value. Such that any temptation you might have or need to demonstrate the reliability of your word, I hear it all the time. When you really want to be understood or really know that I really am telling the truth this time, I swear it. It's just not needed. Because your word's so reliable. The reliability of your word has established a track record of honesty. Now, to that question, is it a sin then to take an oath, let's say before a judge or in court? 
No, I don't think so. Again, Jesus is much more after the heart than he is the letter. <laughs> because, consider this, the author of Hebrews brings this out, that even God took an oath. Though he never even lies. Nevertheless, he took an oath before Abraham. Why? For what reason? Hebrews 6.17 tells us. So when God desired to show more convincingly the unchangeable nature of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Oaths are not sinful inherently, apparently. But for kingdom people, they're not necessary. And why not? Because you should so routine, routinely mean what you say. Your yes means yes, and your no means no. Your word becomes reliable like your Father in heaven who never lies. Heaven raises our estimation of our word. Two, it raises our willingness to be wrong. Here Jesus begins with the famous Old Testament principle known as lex talionis, the law of retribution. Verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now despite how some might have thought to apply this principle, it was never intended in the Old Testament law anyways to encourage vengeance or retaliation. The saying or some form of it, it surfaces repeatedly in the law, like one example in Exodus 21. And if you go and look in all of its contexts, it's about establishing justice and equity, namely to prevent or curb vengeful, think they're excessive, or out of control retaliation. It's to try and guard the people from taking matters into their own hands. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, is to give some handles, some parameters on what equity should look like in their civil society as the nation of God. Such that you hurt someone, even accidentally, or you injure their stuff, or their belongings, or their animals. You have to make it right. That's what this law is about. And this law principle guided them in their court system. That their courts could make fair judgments. But no doubt, under the letter of the law, eye for an eye. You might easily imagine how people might try and take justice into their own hands, right? And when this principle gets taken out of the court system and into the personal arena, as one has said, it could scarcely foster even rough justice, but only bitterness, vengeance, malice, and hatred. He's right. That's what it does. And where Jesus goes in contrast to any personal retaliation is a series of six commands here that undercut our claim to personal rights and prerogatives. And it starts with this overarching call in verse 39. He says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Do not resist. Do not oppose. Do not stand against him. Well, Jesus, what do you mean? Well, he illustrates it here in several ways. Let's look at now verse 39. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. In a culture dominated by right-handed people, to be struck across the cheek would require a right-handed person to strike you with the backside of their right hand. The point is, this is not about fighting. This is an insult. This is the most shameful strike. And instead of retaliating back with insult or maybe with fighting, you're supposed to just turn the other. Or take this scenario, verse 40. But if anyone would sue you and take your turn tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Again, this is the picture of a law court. Then someone's suing you for the very clothes off your back. And then Jesus says, well, offer up your cloak as well. Now see, this outer garment, your cloak, could not be taken away by Old Testament law, even if you were sued. Exodus 22 and Deuteronomy 24 forbade that. And yet, Jesus calls those of his kingdom to hold those things that even rightful things the law would give you with open hands. Even as others wish to do you wrong. Or here's another example, verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go within two miles. By law, Roman soldiers could require a passerby and conscript them to carry their luggage or their effects. 
And so instead of hearing the call from the soldier and ignoring it or thinking, I'm above that, I don't need to do those kind of labors, those in Christ's kingdom not only obey the call to the law, but they even be willing to go the extra mile, so to speak. Why? Because the person of Christ's kingdom is about service and helping others, you see, not retaliation, not after their rights and justice. Now, if going the extra mile doesn't make us look different out of this earth, then the next word he gives certainly will. Verse 32. Excuse me, 42. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. There is no place in God's kingdom for his people to be tight-fisted with their cash. We are not to be greedy, but caring and generous as we have opportunity. Such that if people ask and they be in need, be ready to give, be ready to help. And in particular, we're not to be about questioning qualifications, weighing fairness especially. Well, if I give him something, that's not really fair. I know what he's going to do with it and it's not going to be good. Or especially... But how is that fair? I worked hard and I saved, and then this slacker gets help? That's just not, that's not fair to me. And that's the point. Jesus isn't calling you to figure out financial equity and justice, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, dollar for dollar. He's calling us to overflow with generosity. He's calling us not to be fair, but gracious and generous. He's calling us to show, I'm holy unto heaven, not the dollars on earth. We don't overcome evil with more evil and retaliation. We can overcome evil how? Good. A kingdom people characterized by that, we will stand out. We will look different. We will shine forth the goodness and generosity and grace of our heavenly King. Now, many of us, dare I say most of us, need to just wrestle with what King Jesus has said and just put a period there, right there. We need to just stop and we need to be challenged. We need to be convicted. We need to be brought to repentance for our calculating hard hearts that distorts heaven's just generosity. Namely, that he's given to us. Most of you need to now stop listening for about two minutes. Now, there's some of us here that have a particularly sensitive conscience that then take these extreme examples from Jesus and you don't hear them against the whole wisdom of Scripture. <laughs> While Jesus bids us turn the other cheek, Paul sometimes, for example, he took beatings for the gospel's sake and other times, but for the sake of the gospel, he appealed to his Roman citizenship so he didn't receive a beating. Or elsewhere at other times, there were these new followers of Christ in the way, and they bore the sword. They were soldiers, and they were not forced to change possessions or resign. Rather, they asked about this in Luke chapter 3, verse 14. They were merely commanded to not take advantage of their authority. And finally, to deal with the one who would ask you, the one who begged from you to give to them. Paul has to clarify with the Thessalonians that the one who has no desire to work, that one shouldn't eat. Or note this, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, the apostle instructs Timothy about which widows to not care for. He creates a rather stringent list of those widows who should actually receive financial help from the assembly. What's the point? Just because there is a need in wisdom, that doesn't mean you need to meet it necessarily and immediately. And actually, in some cases, it might be foolish to do so because you're enabling more sinful behavior. That's not wise. And that's not at the heart of what Jesus is even getting at here. We can all listen again. This, in principle, is not about being preoccupied with our rights. This is not about what's fair for us this isn't about, kingdom people are not to be about, what do I get out of it? It's about generosity. It's about grace. That wants to wisely do good and help others. To do what's best for them, even at our own loss and sacrifice.
Because what we find next is that we emulate God best when we show grace to those who don't deserve it, who haven't earned it. That's heaven breaking into our world, and it does through the changed hearts of His people. We see here that heaven raises our love to heaven's height. Now Jesus turns to the whole sum of the law itself as it relates to others, the law of love. And he begins with that same opening phrase, quoting from the Old Testament law, but he doesn't stop there because he adds their common teaching or take on that law. Look at verse 43. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now the first part of that quote is taken right out of the law, right out of Leviticus 19, verse 18. But then he tacks on a phrase that's found nowhere in the Old Testament law or the prophets, that phrase, and hate your enemy. The Jewish leaders had twisted the intent of the law and so then used it as a covering for their sin to justify their own bitterness, their, pre their prejudice and hatred. Hence, when they read, love your neighbor, they understand it to mean love only your neighbor and you can hate all others, apparently. Such later on, they will pose the question to Jesus about their love and what will they ask in Luke 10, 29? They will ask the question, well, who is my neighbor? Only so they can figure out who I don't have to love and who am I allowed to hate. Or such that there's a Jewish sect that settled in Qumran in Israel there. They were made famous because of the Dead Sea Scrolls that are associated with those. They expressly urged those in the camp, love the brothers and hate the outsider. That may have been what the Jews taught. That may have been what was in their hearts. But that was never God's intention as He gave the law, and it's certainly not Christ as He puts the law in our hearts. Instead, Jesus says, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You shouldn't hate those who oppose you, your enemies, but you should love them. This is radical thinking. It cuts against all of our personal, earthly, and even worldly reflexes. We're called to love enemies, even to pray for them, and not just in precatory psalms, to be clear. As crazy as it might seem, especially in the world's eyes, though, is that not the kind of love that our Christ has shown us in the gospel? I mean, these very things. Think of Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, think they're enemies, rebels, with hard hearts, haters, Christ died for us, it says. Enemies though we were. Or in Luke's gospel, even as they drove the nails into his hands and his feet, Luke 23, verse 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what we do. He prayed for them. He prayed for their forgiveness. He prayed for his killers, his murderers. He loved them. He died for them, people like that. That's how heaven loves. That's what our God in heaven is like. And that's precisely Jesus' point as he goes on to explain. Look at verse 45. So that you may be sons of your Father is, who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. When you love your enemies, when you pray for those who hate you and persecute you, you are probably never acting more there like your Father in Heaven than you are when you do that. When you show love and concern for those who don't deserve it, those who are not worthy of it. For otherwise, to Jesus' point, you're no different than the rest of the world, the rest of those people on the earth. He explains for us, look at verse 30, 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? They do. Or, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And they do. Even wicked people, bad people, love those who love them. In that sense, loving your wife and your kids doesn't make you a stand-up Christian. There's nothing necessarily Christian about it. That's just familiar. That's base-level love that the world easily emulates. Love your enemies, though. Pursue good, genuine good for them at cost to yourself. That's strange. That's otherworldly. That's alien. 
That kind of level that comes from that. Verse 48. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we return then to that opening question. Can others see heaven inside of you? Does the light of your heavenly Father shine out of you? That is, the mark of the people of God's kingdom, and the kingdom of heaven, can it be seen in you? Well, if so, what are they going to see? What are they going to see in you? What would it mean then to be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect? Is it that they see you're a very religious person? You're a very spiritually serious person? You're a very pious person? You're a very separate from sin type person? You're a very good sermon listener person? Well, that alone only gives you a righteousness like the Pharisees, you see. Apparently, being perfect like our Father in Heaven is something more than that. What is it? Well, it's interesting. As you go to Luke's Gospel, when he records this part of Jesus' sermon, Luke's language is a little bit different. It fits right in the context, and very nicely, however, and I think he draws out the particular angle of God's perfection that Jesus is highlighting here. Just listen. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. And this all sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then he adds, For he, the Most High, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. He's hitting those same topics, but to sum it up, sum it up what does he say about our Heavenly Father? He's kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. And then Jesus adds, Luke 6, 36, be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. The same language, but perfect has been replaced by merciful. What then does perfection look like? Well, what does it look like when heaven breaks in and makes you perfect, transforming your heart? It will look like mercy. Love for the undeserving. And why? Because so fundamentally, that's what our God is like. And praise God he is. That's why Israel held on to that word that was given on Mount Sinai that he is the Lord. The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In other words, he is perfect. And kingdom people who have tasted that perfection have been recipients of that love and mercy at the cross such that Heaven comes in and it changes your heart. You start to show compassion because God has shown you so much more. You start to care and love because your heavenly Father has loved you so much more. You start to imitate the love of your Father in heaven because the goodness of heaven is so much better than the sin, the hatred, and the vengeance that we have on earth. And so, as people of Christ's kingdom, can others see the mercy of God in you? And where we might fall short, as it comes to your mind this morning, that comes as a great reminder, especially as we come to this table, that we come with boldness because God is merciful. He is merciful to sinners in Jesus Christ. That's who He is. And with those fresh assurances of His mercy, we pour out that mercy to others, leading them back to this table where all who are coming, what are we saying? We are needy, beggars for mercy, then guess what? When you ask Him for mercy, He won't turn you away. That's why He tells us to do the same. Let's rejoice in that mercy as we take this table today. Let's pray. And as I pray, with the men who have been assigned to distribute the elements now come forward.